Bless you. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you came to worship the Lord with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I want to talk about a man with militant faith. A man with militant faith. While you're turning your way there, I uh, do want to encourage you, sign up for the EXO Marriage Conference. If you're married, uh, if you were uh, engaged to be married, if you're dating and, and you're headed towards marriage, uh, I want to tell you it's such a wonderful time, uh, full of a lot of humor, full of a lot of love, uh, full of a lot of really helpful um, tools for, for just improving your marriage relationship and just experiencing joy in your marriage. It's a Friday evening and a Saturday morning, and uh, I hope you'll come and be with us. You know, every year, um, I don't think it can, I, you know, it, we've, we've run this for several years, and, and so each year I think, well, it's going to be the same, and every year it just gets better than it was the year before. So I hope that you'll come and be part of that with us. When I ask you to pray for Pastor Jason, um, he did have surgery this last Tuesday on his vocal vocal cords and uh, the surgery, the, the surgeon was extremely happy with the outcome of the surgery. He's been in a lot of discomfort and uh, he's on the piano this morning, but if he doesn't greet you, it's not because he doesn't like you, it's because he can't talk, all right? So just, you know, if you know sign language, just bless him in sign language or just give him a pat on the shoulder, but um, he's, he's on complete uh, voice restriction right now, so he's not allowed to talk or to sing, but please do keep him in your prayers for a speedy, speedy recovery. And uh, thank you for all your prayers for faith too. We're moving along every day. I want to tell you, it's so exciting. Um, the, the, the rate at which we're making progress in the sanctuary right now, all of the seats were delivered this last week on Tuesday for the new sanctuary. Yeah, they're all, thank you for everyone who purchased seats. They're all in those uh, tractor trailers out there parked at the end of the parking lot. Uh, we're working on the floors in the sanctuary right now. Uh, we have to polish for acoustic reasons under the seats in the new sanctuary is polished concrete. Uh, it's hard floor. And so the, the floor is about half finished in the sanctuary. And we're working up on the ceiling right now. Got to finish some things in the ceiling because once the seats go in, then it gets very difficult to move the lifts around and get all the way up to the ceiling. I was kind of laughing looking at these like little dinky speakers in here. The, the speakers in the new sanctuary weigh 240 pounds. They're the size of a man, a big man. And uh, so we, we hung eight of them this week. The sound system's being installed. And uh, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all your giving uh, as we move along. All right, look with me in Luke 7. Luke chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Let's talk about a man with militant faith. A man with militant faith. Luke 7, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and they found the servant well. Praise God. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your powerful word and your presence with us. Father, I pray that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. When Jesus walked among us, he was all about ministering to outsiders. Aren't you so glad that Jesus loves those that others call outsiders? 
He was called a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors were considered traitors by the Jewish people because they worked for the enemy. The Roman sinners were people who had fallen so far away from the Jewish faith they just didn't even try anymore. They didn't even try to keep the faith. Jesus ministered to outsiders. He ministered to Samaritans and to Canaanites and to Roman soldiers. In the synagogue, Jesus announced that he came to rescue the poor and the prisoners and the blind and the oppressed, all people who were outsiders. And during his earthly ministry, there was a very small handful of people that Jesus commended for having great faith. Do you know that all of them were outsiders? We've been looking at stories of faith together. We've been looking at the heroes of the Bible and considering the defining moments of faith in their lives. We've been taking encouragement from them. We've been learning from them. The Bible says that all of their stories are written down for our benefit. As a congregation, we've come to our own defining moment of faith as we're finishing up our new sanctuary. This is a dream that was born over 20 years ago, and now we're just a few short weeks away. And we're earnestly praying that the Lord will provide everything we need to finish first the sanctuary level and, and then the lower level. Actually, I have a prayer assignment I want to give for those that are willing to accept it. Maybe you remember, but before we ever started building, we drew the outline of the new building in paint on the lawn and on part of the parking lot. Do you remember when we did that? And for weeks and weeks, we had people who came every day and walked those lines praying for the new building. People came early in the morning, people came during the day, people came in the early evening hours. We had a, a fire in the night, an all-night prayer meeting in, in June. Brother Nolan was with me, and, and after midnight, he and I were walking the lines and praying. It was a beautiful, perfectly clear night. The stars were out, there was not a single cloud in the sky, and a cloud in the shape of a cross, the formation of a cross, just hovered for about two hours over, right over our property. Now, you might think whatever you want about that, but I know it was a sign from my father that he was with us. At that time, building was just a, an impossibility. We didn't have any money. We didn't have a mortgage. We, all we had was a $24 million uh, estimate and a deadline that we had to start. But as we prayed, the Lord started putting the pieces together. $24 million has shrunk to $13.1 million. When does that happen? What looked utterly impossible is now visible. But we need a little push to help us finish. So here's, here's what I'm asking you to do. Here's the prayer assignment. Would you come and would you circle the building in prayer again? Now this time you get to do it inside the new building. You don't have to walk outside. You can come walk inside in the sanctuary level and down on the lower level. But I, I want some of my prayer warriors to come and pray. Come and pray in the morning. Uh, you can pray during the daytime, especially in the early evening after the workmen have gone home. Uh, uh, the lights are on. We keep them on uh, all the time for security purposes and for safety. But, but would you come and, and pray and circle the building? We have a fire in the night coming up uh, in two weeks, an all-night prayer meeting on a Friday night. And uh, I, I just I want to have people circling the building all night long. I, I already sequestered Nolan and told him he has to be with me after midnight. We're going to look through the skylight and see if we see another, another sign in the heavens. Uh, but we know that God is with us. And so thank Thank you for praying. This is a time for faith. And when we need faith, we go to the word of God. Today, I want to talk about a man with militant faith. The Capernaum centurion is an example of great faith. Jesus turned and said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. And as I look at this centurion, I see three qualities of great faith, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Three qualities of great faith. First of all, great faith believes on Jesus from a distance. Great faith believes on Jesus from a distance. Luke wrote his gospel 
for people just like us. He wrote his gospel for Gentile people who had never seen Jesus face to face, and yet they believed on him. And that was also the centurion. The centurion never saw Jesus, but he believed on Jesus. And what he shows us is that great faith comes from hearing. Jesus commended the faith of the centurion as superior faith to what he found anywhere in Israel because it was faith that came by hearing. Luke says when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent emissaries asking Jesus to come heal his servant. Beloved, I want to tell you when it comes to faith, hearing is better than seeing. Because hearing has the ability to make our hearts believe. Now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Jewish people had seen Jesus' miracles and yet they remained unconvinced about him. The centurion had only heard about Jesus and yet he believed. He was just like Naaman, the Syrian general in the days of Elisha, who heard from a little slave girl that there was a God in Israel who heals. And based on what Naaman heard, he crossed mountains to receive his miracle while many lepers in Israel remained sick. Do you ever read the gospel and wish you could have been there? If only we could have been eyewitnesses to Jesus. If only we could have seen his miracles. If only we could have seen him face to face. It would be so much easier to believe. Or would it? You see, Jesus commends faith that comes by hearing as great faith, superior faith. This was the faith of the centurion. And it's our faith too. After he rose from the dead, Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, you believe because you've seen me, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The centurion shows us not only that great faith comes by hearing, but he shows us that great faith is focused on the person of Jesus. The Jewish elders, the people of Capernaum and Galilee, even the disciples of John the Baptist had all seen Jesus perform many miracles, yet they weren't convinced about his identity but based solely on what he heard the centurion amazingly drew a few conclusions about Jesus first based on what he heard he concluded that Jesus has a special relationship to God the centurion realized Jesus has uncommon rank under God he, he said to Jesus I know who you are I recognize it because I too am a man under authority he recognized that Jesus was a unique representative of God someone of uncommon stature he recognized that Jesus had received a special commission from God he recognized that Jesus was operating at a superior level of God-given authority than anything that had ever been seen on the earth before. Second, based on he, what he heard, he concluded that Jesus has the power to save. One thing about this centurion, he was absolutely as serious as a heart attack. He did not believe in fool's errands. He didn't believe in unnecessary expenditures or exertion of energy. He, he valued economy and efficiency. He didn't dispatch messengers to see if perchance Jesus could help. He dispatched messengers because he was fully persuaded that Jesus saves. He, he wasn't like the father of that demonized boy who said to Jesus, Lord, if you can help, would you do something? Jesus had, broke down and had a Bronx moment. He said, if I can help? Oh, no, you didn't say that. No, the centurion, he sent messengers to ask Jesus to come save the life of his servant. Great faith doesn't say, Jesus, do something if you can. Great faith says, Jesus, do what I know you can do. Based on what he heard, he also concluded that Jesus is merciful. 
The centurion believed that Jesus not only could save, but that he would save. He believed that Jesus was not only able, but that Jesus was also willing. Luke wrote his gospel for people like you and me, people who have only heard about Jesus. He wrote that so like the centurion, we too would believe on Jesus at a distance, that Jesus has a special relationship to God, that he is the unique son of God in whom dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and to whom all authority has been given in heaven and on earth, that we would believe that Jesus has the power to save and that he is merciful. He is not only able to help us but he is willing Peter wrote though you haven't seen him you love him and even though you don't see him now you believe in him and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls that's good right there (laughs) thank you for that golf clap Three qualities of great faith. Number one, great faith believes in Jesus from a distance. Secondly, great faith reaches out to Jesus across the distance. What do we learn about great faith from this centurion? Well, first of all, he shows us that great faith is undaunted by the distance. The centurion was separated from Jesus in just about every way possible. He was ethnically and culturally separated from Jesus. He was a Gentile. He was uncircumcised. He he didn't keep kosher. Jesus was an observant Jew. The centurion was religiously separated from Jesus. He was interested in the Jewish God, but he hadn't made a commitment to the Jewish faith. He had not entered into the Jewish covenant. Jesus was the living embodiment of Judaism. He was the author and the finisher of the Jewish covenant. The centurion was socially and economically separated from Jesus. He was a military officer. Jesus was an itinerant preacher. He was wealthy. Jesus was a non-profit prophet. The centurion was politically and philosophically separated from Jesus. He was the representative of an occupying government. And Jesus is the deliverer of the oppressed. Aren't you thankful that Jesus can close the distance when people are separated from one another? When people are separated ethnically or racially or culturally or religiously or socially or economically or politically or philosophically, Jesus is the peace that tears down the walls of hostility that separate us from one another. Imagine that, people from Haiti and people from Africa and people from America and people from Norway can come and worship together and fellowship together and serve God together and build something beautiful together. Isn't it amazing? We can come together and we can worship and we can love each other and value each other and then we can go home and some of us will eat rice and beans and some of us will eat meat and potatoes and some of us will eat chapati and some of us will eat pasta. The centurion was separated from Jesus in every possible way, but he was undaunted by the distance. He was determined to find a way to reach Jesus. He shows us that great faith is not only undaunted by the distance, but great faith works by love. You know, it was the love of a little Jewish slave girl for the great general Naaman that saved his life. And now it was the love of this centurion for his slave that moved him to reach out to Jesus on behalf of that slave. The centurion was a great lover of people. He was noble. He was just. He was generous. He was compassionate. He was also a man of action. He regarded the life of his slave as precious. And so he prevailed on Jesus to save him. Beloved, great faith works 
by love. Salvation and healing can be released by, by the faith of one working on behalf of another. Do you know that your faith working by love is able to bring God's saving help to another person? Your faith working by love is able to bring God's saving help to another marriage, to another family, to another person in need. Your your faith working by love is able to bring God's saving help to someone else's sick body. Don't stop testifying about Jesus like that little slave girl. Don't stop telling people of his great power and his love. Don't stop telling them that he can save, that he can heal, that he can rescue, that he can restore, that he can fix what's unfixable, and he can change what is unchangeable. Don't stop telling them that he alone can give peace. Don't stop telling them that he is not only able, but he is willing. Don't stop imploring them to reach out to God. Don't stop testifying like the little slave girl. And don't stop entreating Jesus on others' behalf like the centurion. Don't stop interceding in prayer. Don't stop fasting. Don't stop praying corporately. Don't stop spiritual warfare. Don't stop petitioning God for those under your own roof, for those who have been entrusted to your leadership and care, for those who you work with, for those who you love. Don't stop asking. Don't stop seeking. Don't stop knocking. Pray, pray, pray with escalating urgency and tenacity and anticipation, and God will answer, answer, answer. The centurion shows us that great faith is undaunted by the distance. It works by love. And great faith is creatively determined. It always finds a way to reach Jesus. The centurion refused to be deterred by the distance between him and Jesus. Being a Gentile soldier, he didn't regard himself worthy to approach a Jewish rabbi So he called in a favor. Now the Bible doesn't say that he was a Roman. The the Roman Empire was so vast that centurions came from many, many different countries. However, based on Luke's account, I'm pretty sure that he was definitely Italian because he called in a favor. (laughs) He sent a group of Jewish elders from Capernaum to approach the Jewish rabbi on his behalf. His faith was creatively determined, like the four men that carried their paralyzed friend on a mat, like the bleeding woman, like the Canaanite woman, like Bartimaeus. When the doorway is blocked, faith finds an outdoor staircase. When there is no opening, faith tears one open. When there is no way to approach Jesus directly, faith sneaks up behind him. When there's the answer is no, faith bargains, faith negotiates. When the crowd says, be quiet, faith Faith shouts louder and louder. The centurion shows us that great faith is creatively determined. And he shows us that great faith appeals to God's goodness alone. The centurion was separated from Jesus in every which way. But he was separated from Jesus in one ultimate way that trumped all of them. He was separated from Jesus by his sinful humanity. He sent a delegation of Jewish elders that were indebted to his generosity on behalf of the synagogue. He didn't just make a pledge towards phase two. He built the whole thing from the foundation to the finials. Oh God, send us a centurion, please. He he sent the Jewish elders knowing that they would put in a good word for him with Jesus. And sure enough, they did. When they came to Jesus, they entreated Jesus earnestly. Lord, this man is worthy of your help because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. He's a good guy. God, he built phase two. He deserves your help. Without saying a word, 
Jesus began to move. I love that this story reminds us that Jesus is not just a message. He is God on the move. He is God at work in the world. Jesus is not just information. He is God involved in people's lives. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is a very present help in time of trouble. He's God involved in people's families. He's God involved in people's pain. Jesus is interruptible. That's bad grammar, but it's good preaching. He's not so busy running the universe that he lets your calls go through to voicemail. He said, call me and I'll pick up and I'll give you the 411. Jesus is not just teaching, he is God touching. Jesus began to move. Man, that's good right there. You could camp right there. But as the centurion sat home thinking about the delegation he sent, he didn't feel right about it. That wasn't the way he really wanted to approach Jesus, leveraging his influence. Beloved, I want to tell you, authority in the kingdom of heaven does not move through politics. The Father bestows authority and favor on the humble. That, that wasn't really the message he wanted to send to Jesus. He didn't want to appeal to Jesus on the basis of his own good character or his own good deeds. So he sent a second delegation. This time, the Bible says that he sent a group of his friends, probably also Gentiles, with a different message for Jesus. Jesus, don't come. I don't deserve for you to come under my roof. You see, he understood that because he didn't keep kosher, because he was uncircumcised, because he was unclean, it would put a Jewish rabbi into an, an awkward position to come into his house. He said, I don't deserve for you to come under my roof. I don't even deserve to meet you face to face on the street. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion was keenly aware that of all the things that created distance between he and Jesus, the greatest one by far was his sinful humanity. His reaction was very much like Peter's that day on the fishing boat when Peter fell down on his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. The centurion realized that the only way to appeal to Jesus was not on the basis of his own goodness, but solely on the basis of Jesus' goodness. Jesus saves. Jesus helps. Jesus heals. Not because we are good, but because he is good. Sometimes in our prayers for ourselves or for others, we approach God like that centurion's first delegation. We entreat God on the basis of our own good works. Lord, you know I've been faithful all these years. Lord, I've served. I've sown seed. I kept my pledge to phase two. I've sacrificed. God, you've got to help me. There have been times that, that I've interceded for others like the first delegation. I've even at times felt indignant with God when, when people who are fine believers are going through suffering. God, he's been so good. He's done so much good. He's done so much for missions. Lord, she's such a fine and faithful servant. How can you not help if anybody deserves your help, Lord? She does. I've prayed like that at times. Sometimes we even make ourselves crazy with this stuff. Maybe if I keep all the rules... God will answer my prayer. Maybe if I'm a good little boy, if I'm a good little girl, if I do my devotions every day this week, if I bring my tithe, if I volunteer for the nursery, if I volunteer for the parking lot, <laughs> maybe God will answer my prayer as if it were quid pro quo. But the centurion shows us that great faith appeals to God on the basis of his goodness alone. Great faith says, God, I am not asking you for help because I'm worthy, but I'm asking because I know you are good. Ironically, through this entire story, 
the centurion is missing in action. He never appears. We know all kinds of things about him, but we never once see him. Like Naaman, who never saw the face of Elisha, the prophet, the centurion never saw the face of Jesus or spoke to Jesus directly. And therein lies an essential spiritual truth. Salvation and healing are dependent solely on the power and mercy of Jesus. We do nothing to attain it. We do nothing to merit it. We do nothing to elicit it other than to humbly ask Jesus to do it because it's the good kind of God that he is. The centurion set out to attain a miracle on the basis of his good deeds, but the way he actually attained the miracle was by confessing his need as a sinful man. The centurion's conspicuous absence in this whole story shouts to us. Answers to prayer don't depend on us. They depend only on God's goodness. Healing miracles don't depend on us. They depend on him. He doesn't help the worthy. He helps the needy. You know, God helps those who help themselves. In case you didn't know, it is not in the Bible, all right? Benjamin Franklin said it, not Jesus. God helps those who can't help themselves. That's the gospel. Beloved, when I tell you, when you get that in your spirit, it liberates you. Jesus saves not because I have been good, but only because he is good. Jesus gives me the gift of the Holy Spirit, not because I have been good enough, but because he is good, because he's a good father. He helps because he's good. He heals because because he's good. All of it left Jesus shaking his head in amazement. Somehow from a great distance, the centurion understood this profound spiritual truth while the people closest to Jesus struggled to figure it out. There's only two times in the Gospels that Jesus was amazed. One time he was amazed by the unbelief of the people in Nazareth. And the other time he was amazed by the great faith of the centurion. Beloved, I pray that when God looks at us, he is amazed. And I pray that he is not amazed by our unbelief. But I pray that he is amazed by our great faith that reaches out across the distance. Because we know in our hearts that he is good. Three qualities of great faith. Great faith believes on Jesus from a distance. Great faith reaches out to Jesus across the distance. And finally this, great faith receives Jesus' healing at a distance. Great faith receives Jesus' healing at a distance. This centurion is an example of great faith. He shows us that great faith recognizes that physical healing is a spiritual transaction. Somehow from a distance, this centurion understood that physical illnesses have spiritual causes and they have spiritual cures. Somehow from a distance, he understood that Jesus was able to do something in the spiritual realm that would affect a healing in the physical realm. He realized that Jesus was able to release something supernatural that would affect change in the natural realm. He realized that distance made absolutely no difference whatsoever. Beloved, listen to me. Distance is no barrier for Jesus. He is able to release the miracle working power of God without limit and without measure. That's why we pray for people here who are across the miles and we believe that God can touch them wherever they are. That's why we pray for our kids from here and we believe that whether they live down south or in the Midwest or on the West Coast or whether they live overseas, we believe that we can pray for them here and God can touch them wherever they are. It's why we pray for our missionaries here and we trust that God can strengthen them and he can make them fruitful and watch out for them and protect them anywhere they are around the globe. When we pray, we believe that God is releasing something supernatural in the heavenly realm that will affect change on the earthly realm. That's why we pray on earth 
as it is in heaven. When we pray, we believe that God is releasing his blessing over people and places. The wholeness of God is being released. When we pray, we believe that the authority and the order of heaven is being released over homes and workplaces. I love what it says. It says, when the second delegation arrived back home at the centurion's house, they found the slave not just healed, but they found him healthy. That's what Jesus does. He makes us healthy. He makes us whole. The centurion shows us that great faith recognizes that healing is released by the will and the word of Jesus. The centurion stopped Jesus from walking any further because he realized that that healing does not come through religious rites or religious ceremonies or rituals. All that was necessary was for Jesus to will it and to release the word. Beloved, listen to me. Healing does not come from holy oil. It doesn't come from miracles, spring water. It doesn't come from holy prayer cloth. Save your money. Give it to the phase two building fund. Healing doesn't come from candles. It doesn't come from incense. It doesn't come from crystals. It doesn't come from icons. It doesn't come from beads. It doesn't come from reciting formulaic prayers over and over again. Healing comes from only Jesus. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Only say the word and my servant shall be healed. The centurion shows us that great faith recognizes that Jesus has command of both soldiers and slaves. The centurion sent word to Jesus, I recognize who you are. I too am a man under authority. I too have soldiers and slaves that do my bidding just like you. The centurion realized Jesus didn't have to take one more step because Jesus has an army of soldiers ready to do his bidding. He is Lord Sabaoth. He is the captain of the host. He is the commander of the angelic armies of heaven. His ministers are flames of fire. The centurion realized that when Jesus commands his army of soldiers to move in the heavenly realm, that things happen on earth. When Jesus gives the command, there's a sound of marching in the top of the mulberry trees. When Jesus gives the command, the Arameans hear the sound of horses and chariots and a great army. When Jesus gives the command, the enemy is put to flight. You know what Jesus said about the least person in the kingdom? I want you to think about the the weakest, most wishy-washy Christian you've ever known in your life who who just didn't seem to be able to get one step in front of the other in the kingdom of God, in his Christian life. Jesus said the least person in the kingdom of God, even the least, has been assigned an angel. And that angel's face is always staring intently at the face of God, just waiting for God to give the signal and dispatch that angel to go to his rescue. My God, open the eyes of your people that we might see that the hills are full of horses and chariots of fire, that those who are with us are more than those who are against us. I want you to know when you leave the house in the morning, you don't leave the house alone. There's some horses and chariots of fire that are waiting at your front door. They're riding beside your car all the way to work. They go into the workplace. Somebody trying to do you dirty in the workplace, don't you worry about it because those who are with you are greater than those who are against you. The centurion recognized that Jesus has command over soldiers and slaves. The angels of heaven are his army and the demons of hell are subservient to him. When Jesus gives the command, spirits of infirmity must relent. Cancer must go. Skin disorders must go. Generational illnesses 
must go. When Jesus gives the command, harassing spirits must let go. When Jesus gives the command, depression has to let go. Bye-bye, depression. Anxiety has to go. Bipolar disease has to go. OCD, ADD, ADHD, ABCD, EFG. Jesus died for you and me. It all has to go when Jesus says go. When Jesus gives the command, spirits of addiction must let go. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant shall be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I tell my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. What's the takeaway from the man with militant faith? Here's the takeaway. You don't have to have a face-to-face encounter. You don't have to see Jesus face-to-face to to have a one-on-one encounter with him. All you need is faith. Believe in Jesus from a distance. Reach out to him. Receive his healing from a distance. Would you stand together? And would you give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, I want you to give Jesus a great big praise. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's give him a good praise. Just one moment, we're going to receive communion together for our final act of worship and then we're going to go on with our Sunday we're going to start a new week in the Lord but just before we do I want us to just pray together in response to the word we were singing a chorus during worship I'm no longer a slave to fear I'm a child of God would you lift that up I'm no longer wasn't there before faith that comes by hearing you've heard the word of Jesus today and God's given you a deposit of faith in your heart listen God doesn't help you because you've been good he helps you because you need help he helps you because he's good he doesn't help you because you're worthy but because he's good. I feel like there's someone with a spark of faith in your heart today. And I want to lead us in a prayer of believing. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to say this prayer with us 
and just reach out. I want to tell you what, there's no distance between you and Jesus this morning. You reach out, he's right here in this room. Some of you, you're really in a position in life where you're, you're just at the end of your rope. At the end of the rope, that's where you find Jesus. That's where he catches you. That's where he meets you. If you're willing, would you, would you lift your face to heaven? Would you lift your hands to the Lord? And I want to lead us in a prayer of believing. And I want to invite everybody, if you're willing, to join me. And let's just put our faith in Jesus this morning. I'm going to lead. I want to invite you to follow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived a sinless life for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need your help. Only say the word and I will be healed. Jesus, I need your changing power. I need to be set free. Jesus, I want to be a new person. Wash me. Make me new. Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, would you give the Lord a praise in this place today? Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time today with a spark of faith in your heart, I want you to know that the distance has just been closed between you and Jesus. And his word of salvation has been sent to heal you.